Okay, so good morning everyone. I am Michael Ernesto S. Arnante. I am an ASF and an equipment specialist for the Central Instrumentation Facility of DLSU Laguna Campus. And I am here to talk about the ICEL or the Imaging and Cell Culture Laboratory. Now, the goal of ICEL is that by the end of 2021, ICEL will become a one-stop shop research laboratory providing reliable services to researchers, faculty, and students from higher education institutions, as well as clients from different public and private sectors, conducting a wide range of studies related to biological systems and corresponding imaging and bioassays. Now in ICEL, we have a couple of main equipment along with other facilities. So these are the confocal laser scanning microscope with live cell imaging system. And we also have the fluorescence microscope with a cytogenetics workstation. We have our culture rooms for different specimens and of course our preparation rooms. Now for the confocal laser scanning microscope, we have the Leica TCS SP8X confocal laser scanning microscope with live cell imaging system. So as you can see here, this is a modular system. So from a in, uh, inverted laser scanning microscope to the power supply along with a live cell incubation chamber with it. Now this is our actual system that is in iCell. So you can see here the two heads of iCell, Dr. Marikit Telos Reyes and Dr. Maria Luis Enriquez, so working on our machine. So it is the first and only system of its kind here in the Philippines. Uh, it's quite unique because traditional confocal microscopes use multiple lasers of different excitations. Uh, however, our system uses a single white light laser producing a continuous spectral output between the wavelengths of 470 and 670 nanometers. Now, another advantage of our system is that instead of single mechanical filters, the system has an acousto-optical beam splitter, or AOBS, capable of selecting any wavelength from the white, uh, from the white spectrum. Uh, it has eight different excitation lines and can combine three trillion unique combinations for simultaneous imaging of multiple fluorescent probes. Now, this is a diagram of how a, uh, AOBS differs from a conventional beam splitter. So, just some of its advantages. So, uh, it's electronically tunable. Uh, it is a fixed device. So, there's no or almost no mechanical movements compared to a disc style uh, conventional beam splitter. Uh, it produces less heat due to less friction. It has a fast switching time. And again, like I said, it it, it has up to eight illumination lines possible simultaneously. Now, these are some example images of what the Leica CLSM can do. So, on the left is uh, a figure, an image of dividing RPE cells, stably expressing EGFP tubulin and IRP histone H2B. So, this is a dual color fluorescent image. As you can see, uh, there are two different fluorescent tags. One is colored cyan and the other is colored magenta. You'll be able to differentiate this and visualize this at the same time. So this is just a two-color image. Now, on the right, we have an example of a paramecium cell stained with seven different dyes excitable in, the div uh, in a visible range. So you can see here seven different fluorescent tags corresponding to different components inside the cell. Then you can view this all at the same time. You can see what's their position, what's their status, what's their structure based on these fluorescent tags. So uh, whether you need just a single color, just a dual color, multicolor, our system can be, uh, are, is able to visualize all of those. So this is an example of a comparison of a standard image from a confocal microscope versus an image from the Leica system. So you can see here, super resolution images of mitochondria. Now, in a standard confocal microscope system, you can see that uh, the outline of these structures are not too clear. And then if you try to magnify them, you'll see that they start to get a bit pixelated. And then if you magnify it further more, you can see that they're, uh, there's almost no recognizable feature. But when you use the system of like a, the SP8X lightning system, so you can see that the outlines of the structures are very crisp and very clear. 
And then if you do your magnification, you will see that the outlines are clearer again. And if you do more magnification, of course, it starts to get pixelated at a certain point. But still, you can observe the outlines compared to a standard confocal microscope. So that's what uh, gives the SPX system an advantage. So this is another uh, capability of the CLSM. So we can do optical sectioning. So we can do, uh, again, the principle of a confocal laser uh, CLSM is that it gets an image from a single plane at a time. So what it does is uh, it takes an image from a single plane and then superimposes them on top of one another to create a combined 3D image. So as you can see in figure eight, those are the uh, uh, optically sectioned images. And then when you combine them, for example, this is a pollen grain, an image of a pollen grain, you will get a combined 3D image. And then when you combine all those images together, you will be able to see the whole picture of whatever is visible in the microscope. So this is a combined image of a group of pollen grains. So this is just an example of the capability of the system. So the images I shared with you are just still images, meaning they were captured at a specific point in time in the cell. Uh, with live cell imaging, another feature of our system, so we can do examination of living cultured cells through an incubation system to visualize cellular changes over time. And then we will be able to record real-time data and observations in cells from a wide array of source organisms, such as humans, animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, and viruses. So this is an example of a live cell image viewed in real time. So these, these are live onion bulb cells stained with DIOC6 with simultaneous transmitted light detection. Now you can see in the image below, it's just a, without the fluorescent tagging, it's just a translucent image uh, of movement. You can see, of course, we can see the movement because the cells are alive. But if you do the fluorescence tagging for that cell, you'll be able to tag the specific cellular component of interest and you can see them in real time in motion while they're in the culture. So that's how it looks like on the image above. Another example of live cell image is this one. These are COS cells transiently transfected with a construct expressing a GFP-fused protein. So it is a cytosolic protein forming needle-like structures in the cell. So as you can see at the start, the needles are still quite short. But over a time-lapse period, you can see that they start to grow bigger and bigger. So you'll be able to record all these data in our system. So what are the possible studies that you can do using the live cell imaging system with confocal microscopy? You'll be able to do, well, of course it's not limited to, but you'll be able to do morphological characterization. You'll be able to observe observation of growth and development in cells. You'll be able to compete for mortality. So for example, uh, survival of cells against a certain agent. You'll be able to see changes in structure of cellular components, whether they're uh, growing, or dying or undergoing a specific uh, cellular process, you'll be able to visualize that. And of course, also movement of objects within the cell or across the cell membrane, where there is movement of structures inside the cell going from one place to another or going inside or outside of the cell, you'll be able to visualize this through specific fluorescent tags. Uh, of course, you can also do investigation of effects of external stimuli on these cells. So just some examples include natural products or drugs, if you want to test for antibacterials, antivirals, anti-cancer compounds, and see what kinds of effects they have in the cell, you'll be able to do this. Uh, they also include physical stimuli, for example, sound, radio waves, or light. What kind of changes occur in the cells, you'll be able to visualize these. Uh, vectors such as nanomaterials. When you have deliveries, nanomaterial delivery systems, you want to see how they go from outside to inside of the cell, you'll be able to visualize those. And then, of course, also genetic and epigenetic changes. If there are mutations, methylations, these events occur inside the cell, but you'll be able to visualize what happens to the cell as a whole as a result of these changes. So just some of these studies, but there, there are a lot more that can be done, of course, with the system. So the second equipment that we have is the Zeiss Actual Imager Z2 with an ASI cytogenetics workstation. So this is a fluorescence microscope as well, but with a complete 
multi-species cytogenetics software. So our system can do all different kinds of chromosomal analysis or karyotyping, whether it's for bright field, so you have your G-banded, R-banded, or if you have fluorescence karyotypes like Q-bands, R-bands, or specific gene targeting fluorescence like fluorescence in cyto hybridization. So you'll be able to also do that. And then when you want to do multicolor fluorescence in cyto hybridization, so their version of that is called spectral karyotyping. So you can see this at the bottom right. You can label each chromosome with a specific tag, a fluorescent tag, and you'll be able to visualize those under the microscope as well. So our system is able to capture both metaphase and interface cells for analysis. So it is an all-in-one platform to analyze chromosomes and classify cells. And it also has a high accuracy of automated karyotyping with auto-ISCN for nomenclature. Uh, auto bands estimation, and auto overlap score. So all these are features to make chromosomal analysis or karyotyping easier. So what are the possible studies this time that can be done using the cytogenetics workstation? So again, it has a multi-species chromosomal analysis platform. We'll be able to sam analyze samples uh, from humans. Let's say we have cultured cancer cell lines. We'll be able to visualize chromosomes from those. Uh, animal samples, whether it's from blood, tissue, or cultured cell lines as well, be able to uh, analyze those as well. Uh, insects, also, we have samples from insects. As long as they have chromosomes, we'll be able to visualize that. And of course, plant samples as well. So from tissues, cell lines, again, we'll be able to use those. And not just that, we can do genetic analysis. So through fish, fluorescence in cytohybridization, you'll be able to visualize overexpression or underexpression of specific genes. You'll be able to observe mutational changes, whether it's from the cellular or the chromosomal or the molecular level, you'll be able to visualize that. And then also uh, genotoxicity assays, when some agent is toxic to the genetic material of your cells, you'll be able to visualize that, such as DNA breakage or apoptosis, among others. Now, these are just a couple of examples of uh, multi-species chromosomal analysis. So on the left side, these are uh, chromosome samples from Aegis aegypti. So it, we know that it's a prime carrier of viruses for dengue fever and Zika in humans. So if you visualize their chromosomes, they actually have three pairs of chromosomes. So you'll be able to see if there are some genetic changes occurring in these insects for, what, oh, for whatever reason, you'll be able to visualize that. And then on the right is a sample from Macaca fascicularis, so the Philippine long-tailed macaque. So these are metaphase chromosomes. So they have 42 chromosomes. They have 42, uh, they have 10 pairs of autosomes and a pair of sex chromosomes. So they are quite close to humans, no? Like we know we have humans have 46 chromosomes, while macaques have 42. So we'll be able to do genetic studies on these kinds of species as well. So apart from those two major equipments, we also have our cell culture rooms. So the iCell facility will have separate culture rooms for mammalian, plant, and microbial cell lines. And each of those culture rooms will have uh, this, the biosafety cabinet, the new Air NU560 class 2 biosafety cabinet. It is the standard biosafety cabinet required for doing uh, cultured cell lines uh, of these species. Now, aside from those, we also have several other equipment in our culture rooms. We have a carbon dioxide incubator for regulation of pH, temperature, humidity in our cultures. So we have the centrifuge for washing. So we have our inverted microscopes for quick viewing of the status of our cell cultures. We have a desiccator for drying our samples. We have an ultra-low freezer for storing our frozen cell culture samples. In case we are still not using them, we have to freeze our samples in ultra-low temperatures in order for them to stay uh, intact before using them. And then we also have our micro microplate reader for doing cytotoxicity studies. If you want to do antibacterial or uh, anti-cancer testing screening tests, we'll be able to do that using our microplate reader. Now, in line with the goals of this symposium, so we want to align 
the vision of ICEL with the sustainable goals of the United Nations, of course. So these are the goals. And then our facility is aligned with several of them. Now, for goal number three, which is good health and well-being, again, we ICEL can perform cellular and molecular studies to discover the mechanisms behind human diseases. So this involves uh, understanding the biological pathways such as apoptosis, signal transduction, aging, among others. So all these will contribute to, uh, of course, good health and well-being, being able to understand the mechanisms of disease in humans. And we can also evaluate potential novel compounds and materials for drug discovery. So just an example, we'll be able to do studies on multicellular tumor spheroid cells for anti-cancer drug screening. Now, these are very interesting because tumor spheroid cells uh, is an in vitro culture of uh, cancer cells but they are almost close enough to in vivo in state. So being able to visualize these kinds of uh, cellular structures will bring us actually close enough to applying uh, possible mechanisms of anti-cancer drugs. So all of these, of course, contribute to good health and well-being. Now, for goal number four, which is quality education, of course, we are not just a basic uh, research laboratory. Since we are under an academic institution, it is our responsibility to provide students and early researchers with facilities and training experiences to support their basic or applied research. So ICEL will be conducting uh, virtual, both virtual trainings and hands-on workshops, not just simply to teach uh, students and clients how to use our machine, but to teach them about the possible uh, future endeavors that they can do in terms of their research, what kind of possibilities uh, uh, they can do uh, in order for future of, uh, for their future study. So all of these contribute to quality education. Now for goal number nine, which is industry innovation and infrastructure, so ICEL will have collaborations with different stakeholders such as R&D, pharmaceutical, bioengineering, and manufacturing companies. So some examples of uh, collaborations that we can work with are doing tissue regeneration studies, the construction of bio scaffolds, and of course 3D printed biopolymers. Now these 3D printed materials are trending nowadays. So there are 3D printed mater studies of materials being done on, uh, and they're being studied on how they interact with different cells. Now, again, these are essential in developing new materials for uh, innovative um, studies. So, so that's, uh, again, those contribute to industry innovation and infrastructure. Uh, for goal number 14, which is life below water, so we'll be able to process samples from freshwater and marine organisms. Like I said, this is a multi-species platform. So just a couple of examples will be from fish aquacultures and shellfish breeding farms. So you'll be able to see what kinds of changes or possible mutations or diseases occur in these uh, bred species. Uh, another possibility would be toxicity studies. We know that there is a high occurrence of pollution in our rivers and seas. So we can study actually heavy metal accumulation, what happens to a cell, the organ or a tissue of a species when they are accumulated with heavy metals. So we can all observe that using our equipment. So all those contribute to studies, of course, from li for life below water. And then as we can study life below water, of course, we can study life on land. So we'll be able to process samples from terrestrial organisms. So examples will be like I showed earlier from uh, cattle, swine, and primates. So all of these uh, higher mammals, we can do uh, genetic studies for whatever purpose we need. We can also study insects like aedes, like I showed you before. We can study what kind of mutations can occur if they are exposed to specific uh, stimuli. And of course, in plants as well, for agricultural studies, you'll be able to see uh, genetic changes. Let's say, for example, we have rice. So these will fall for the genetically modified uh, organisms. So what kind of changes can possibly occur? We have to check all of those. And also, like I said, for agricultural studies, when doing uh, studies for breeding hybrids, and of course, testing for genetic diseases. 
So, all of these are applicable to the goal of life on land. Now, uh, as I said, ICEL, uh, along with its vision, along with all other facilities of the BLSC Laguna Campus, is in line with the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations for the progress of our society and the whole of humanity. So that is it. That is for ICEL. Thank you very much and have a good day.